Welcome to the One Million Years of Joy podcast. I'm Dr. Andrea Benacar, your host, and my intention is to inspire you to find more joy in your life through the stories from our guests and the science on joy and purpose. I'm delighted to introduce you today, Hayden Smith. After devoting 15 years of his career to the transformation of large companies to become more purposeful and human-centric via roles in R&D, innovation, and leadership, Hayden co-founded Siemens Energy Ventures in 2020. Hayden is an engineer, project manager, pilot, and a devoted father of three. He lives with his loving family in Montreal, Canada. Hayden, welcome. It's such a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks, Andrea. It's great to be here. So Hayden, before we talk about joy, tell us about your journey. You're an engineer, you're a pilot, you've done amazing things. What would you like to share with our audience? I started my career. um, Let me start before my career. I actually started my life um, when I can first remember thinking about wanting to change the world for the better. When I was three, four years old, I'd sit for hours and hours uh, later, I learned I was in a state of flow, just building Lego and making these amazing contraptions. My father used to tell me, you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be an architect. And I didn't know what those things were, but I knew that somehow I wanted to build things that would make the world better. By the time I was in elementary school, I started hearing and learning about the damage we were causing to our planet. We learned about CFCs affecting the ozone layer. We learned about um, carbon dioxide and emissions from cars and from burning fossil fuel for energy. Uh, causing damage to our planet from a greenhouse warming perspective. We learned about, uh, in school, I remember, reduce, reuse, recycle. You know, we were just overtaxing the resources of our planet. And so I realized maybe early on in my life, which most people, I, I guess, are not as fortunate as I was to realize this, that I wanted to change the world for the better. And I wanted to use my talents and gifts of building to make that happen. So I went into engineering school. I studied engineering with the intention of joining a, some sort of electric vehicle company or something like that. I realized later, maybe I wanted to be Elon Musk, <laughs> real role model. Um, obviously, I didn't know who he was when I graduated engineering school in 2006 or so. You know, I, I hunted around for jobs and uh, realized uh, I also had a passion for flying. When I was a kid, I used to have dreams of flying out of my window and just flapping my wings and floating over the city and seeing everything from a bird's eye. Uh, And there was something liberating and freeing of that experience. So I always wanted a sense of freedom. I always wanted to use my talents and skills as an engineer and analytical thinker, my creativity to better the world. And uh, I started my career at Rolls-Royce, big uh, aerospace company, but in the energy business had no idea what energy was and and how we generated energy. And I was starting to get a a bit of a flavor from it from engineering school, but really a lot of it was a mystery to me. And uh, through the early parts of my career, I learned two things. One, how incredible energy is as the source of prosperity and dignity and progress for people in our world. Uh, It goes hand in hand, the amount of energy consumed per capita with the prosperity, with the access to education, with you know, income and things like that. It's a question mark whether it goes hand in hand with happiness as well. We could discuss that. I find that a very interesting topic. And I learned a second thing in my early career, which is that I couldn't stand the way big companies were suppressing the talent, the innate ability of human beings within those companies. So I set out on a bit of a journey through my career to try and change that. And uh, I won't uh, go into the details yet. Maybe you have questions for that afterwards. But uh, suffice to say that I made an effort to change the big corporation, um, both sort of from the ground up, then more from a strategic small section of the company uh, and changing that for the better and trying to create fast speedboats that would go and create positive impact for the world. Uh, And now I've left the big corporate world altogether (laughs) trying to make impact faster beyond those constraints. Can you share what were some of those key pillars that allowed you to bring forward some of those large changes that you've mentioned to human energy within corporations? Well, I think the first lever, I would say, is that there's just so much pent up energy. There's so much potential energy. Uh, If you look at energy as being something that cannot be created or destroyed, but only transition from one phase or one form to another, potential energy within us as human beings is there. It turns into kinetic energy as we express our creativity and our talent into the world. And so what I was seeing in big companies is that, unfortunately, that was 
blocked in some way for a lot of people. And, you know, the statistics from Gallup and, and others in terms of disengagement of the global workforce, it's really only 20% of people that show up to work really excited and loving what they do. And I see that as such a tragedy because we spend most of our waking hours at work. So the first lever was just that potential energy being there. So you'd imagine like a huge like water um, body being held up on top of a mountain. There's just so much energy there. All you have to do is sort of like move one of the rocks and then all the energy starts flowing out. So that was the first lever, I think, of change within big companies that I used to my advantage. The second was purpose, because how do you direct, how do you give people a direction, a sense of wanting to unleash that energy and willing also to take risk and be courageous? Because honestly, it's not easy to reaching your full potential in a big company. You have to go outside of the boundaries and big companies work with boundaries. You have to go maybe outside your job description or outside your boss's expectations of you. And those are scary things because nobody wants to displease their boss or lose their job, for example. You know, giving people, helping people find purpose, recognizing that talent and potential is within them, and then helping them to just achieve autonomy and freedom. So working with leaders that were willing to give freedom to their teams uh, and then letting those teams figure out what to do with freedom. Because I love this saying, uh, responsibility is the price of freedom. We create freedom, we give purpose, which gives direction to use that freedom and go somewhere. But then we also have to help people become responsible, which is something innate within people. I believe we can all self-manage. We can all do things in order to be able to create impact towards a purpose. But we have to help people figure out so how to take that responsibility and which work methods to use, how to collaborate, how to make decisions. And so these are some of the methods that we help teams to actually learn. I love what you've just shared. And on the topic of purpose, I was reading an article recently on how some individuals actually have challenges in finding their purpose, and that can actually create distress. Can you share with us how you were able to orient or inspire in others that you've worked with in the past on a global scale to find their purpose? Yeah, absolutely. Simply put, I mean, I used Start With Why, Simon Sinek's approach to helping individuals find their purpose. He has a fantastic guide for facilitators to help people go through that journey. And it really is a journey that's best done together. Because to reflect on one's life and to understand the history and the things that have gone on in your life is not so easy by yourself. If you have someone that's asking you questions and teasing out of you the positive experiences, the negative experiences, the experiences that got you into flow, the things that you would absolutely love to do if you had no constraints, you had a million a billion dollars and you had uh, you know no time constraints at all. So these are the, the essential things that you help to tease out of an individual. And purpose is really just for me, the distillate. When you squeeze out all those fruits of experience of one's life, comes out this juice, you boil it off. And, and what's left is this concentrated purpose, this very simple sort of statement, which I believe is a spiritual thing is something that we come into this world with, as well as the gifts and talents and things we need in order to fulfill that purpose. But finding out the purpose and finding out what our gifts and talents are is the journey of life. And so doing that as a journey with another individual, helping them formulate the essence of those experiences and then come up with a statement for it is really just the beginning of that experience. And since you've mentioned that purpose is a journey, has your purpose from those early days when you're constructing the Legos, building and saying, I want to create a better world, evolved over time? Or, or have you refined it? with greater clarity as a result of your experiences. Can you share with us more details on that? First of all, it started off with just making the world a better place, which is, is really quite vague. And I remember people telling me in my early adult life, um, yeah, that's just great, but you'll never be able to do that because it's too big and it doesn't make sense and there's no clarity. And what does it actually mean? I mean, making the world better. It's true. It's quite esoteric. I took that as a feedback and as a challenge. And I had a coach and a, a partner that at one point in my early career helped me to think about this. I think it was in around 2009. I was struggling at work, uh, getting a bit frustrated with some of the blockers and barriers. I had big dreams. I wanted to change the company. I wanted to make things work in a, a better way. And uh, well, you got to get my approval and then you got to get his approval and her approval and so that was frustrating. One amazing lesson, just as a quick sidebar, which uh, my mentor helped me to realize is that if you don't like the rain, then get out of the rainforest. 
So I didn't really like that rain. And I said, well, if I get out of the rainforest, which rainforest or which forest or which place am I going to go to? So that, that was where purpose came in. And I started thinking this energy thing. I was working in the energy business and I never really planned to get into the energy business. But I started to realize we were producing big uh, fossil burning power generation equipment, which was actually contributing to the problem more than solving it of climate change. And so I said, well, maybe this is the wrong industry. But then I realized that energy actually is the cause, but is also going to be and needs to be the solution to climate change. And I started realizing that the way I was working with the teams that I had worked with, the different leadership style that I had with those teams that also got me promoted because it couldn't really be refuted. People said, well, that works. He solved these big problems with the team. He's helped the team sort of come together and, and create a, a new project or a new product. And so those promotions actually were happening, but I, I didn't really have a sense of what I wanted to do, except when I, I started reflecting and doing this purpose exercise myself for the first time. And then I started realizing that different leadership style that I had, the way of working with people, really what I was doing was helping to unleash their potential. And I realized that there's an essential ingredient of my own purpose that relates to that helping other people unleash and release and, and reach their full potential. And then the second part of it is for what and to what, it, to what end, for what impact. And the energy business, I realized, is a fantastic way of creating more righteousness in the world, which is just a more recent actual understanding of this purpose for myself. Even a month ago, I think I, I've, I've been revolving and evolving and thinking about this. Yeah, it started off as unleashing human energy to innovate the energy of tomorrow, solving climate change with energy. But it's, it's even broadened now that I've left the pure play energy space, uh, because I think that unleashing human energy can be used to, you know, just make a more righteous world. So that's where I'm sort of putting my, my energy today. It's more broad topics as well. And since you've left the corporate world and now you're more in the startup world, what have you learned from the most recent months and experience so far that you can share with us? What I've learned is that, um, first of all, it, it took tremendous courage to make a change like that. You've heard of the term, the golden handcuffs, probably. Uh, so <laughs> we, we get um, into this groove, I guess, of you know, making enough money to afford a certain lifestyle, having a pension, having benefits that sort of take our minds off of things that would otherwise concern us, which is great. And that liberates us to think about higher pursuits. However, it's also constraining because you get stuck in that. And can you leave the corporate world? Can you do it on your own? Can you work in a startup or a smaller company and still have the same income, have the same benefits and bonus and so on? And the answer is no, it's going to be different because the work terms are different. But the realization that nothing changes from one day to the next. I left the big corporate world. Okay, I don't have benefits. I'm on my wife's benefit plan. <laughs> okay, I don't have a bonus at the end of the year, but I shouldn't have planned for that anyways. And there's other you know, upsides in terms of equity and building the company and so on. So I think you have to just have faith and, and be courageous. Realize that if you're pursuing the purpose that you're here for, and if you're using the gifts and talents you were given to do that, then everything will work out. It'll just be okay. Just have faith, be courageous in, in stepping into that. Because I think the world can only be changed for the better by people that are willing to break the mold and to be courageous in pursuing purpose. And you believe that that courage and faith that you have found within yourself has actually changed in any way your creativity and your possibility of really looking at the world with new eyes. Indeed. I mean, just the liberation of energy. So in, in big companies, I, I use the analogy to the energy system of the world. If you understand how energy works, right, it can neither be created nor destroyed. So it can only be moved from one phase to another. The way that we generate energy in the world is typically, you know, by burning fossil fuels for the most part, coal oil, gas, but there's also nuclear and there's other renewable energy sources and others. But two thirds of all of the energy generated in the world goes into waste heat. That's a huge number. When you think about that, like all that fossil fuel you're burning, two thirds of it is just basically going and it's turning into nothing. That's how it feels sometimes in the big corporate world. <laughs> you're, you've got all this energy inside of you. You want to make an impact in the world outside and you end up fighting internal fights that just use a lot of that energy without any real impact. So it goes to waste. 
So I would say that leaving the the big corporation, and I don't mean to say that there's no benefits of big corporations, there are. In fact, I think they're necessary to solve some of the biggest challenges in the world. But uh, certainly one of the things that has been most uplifting for me has been to, to not have to waste that energy and to just have that extra energy to then be creative, to go you know, make meaningful progress towards something in the real world that is positively and meaningfully affecting the lives of other people. And talking about positive impact on people, you have three beautiful kids. Tell us about the impact that you aspire to have on them as a parent and how would you like them to grow basically what are some of the values or a sense of purpose that you hope you can instill in them as a result of your current experience well i gotta say being a parent is the absolute hardest job that nobody prepares you for <laughs> so you go to engineering school for four years to be an engineer then you get there and you're like okay i i know a thing or two about this this job You have your first kid and they pop out and there's been no training. There's been no prep. And all of a sudden you're changing diapers and up all night. And, you know, 11 years later with my eldest, and it feels like yesterday that she was born, you know, you're dealing with challenges with friends and, you know, helping them. So it's, To, for me to profess that I know how to be a good parent, it would be a lie. I, I'm still learning <laughs> I'm on a, a real journey with it, with respect to that. But you said, you know, how am I sort of imparting purpose on them? I, I don't think I am. I think that purpose is, is intrinsic. It's within. So I, I have to impart nothing. I really have to just help them to realize that there is a purpose within them, that they have gifts, they have talents to help them find and see those And when they're, for example, Maya is very musical and artistic. And so helping her to see that she has these gifts and talents and that, you know, you might think that you're just like everyone else. Well, you're not. You have something very special, a gift of music and artistic expression, which, you know, you need to figure out what that is supposed to be used for. And I, I don't know what the answer is, so I can't tell her, but I can definitely help her and encourage her to find that. And for Dovey and Mika, my two younger ones, Um, Davi is an absolute beloved helper, I call him. His name in, in Hebrew means beloved helper. Maybe there's some significance there. Or maybe it's just me <laughs> biasing my own thinking. But it's a, it's a beautiful thing when you see him get up from the dinner table and bring his dishes and then take everyone else's and, Daddy, can I help you? Or I drop something while I'm cooking and he comes and right away picks it up for me. He's just such a beautiful helper. He cares about other people and helping. And so... To, to help him find that gift. What, what is that for? What could you use that for, Dovey? And uh, I was thinking about it this morning, just randomly, it popped into my head. Maybe I haven't done enough of that. I have to spend, maybe a, go on a date with each of them and do a little bit of a purpose discovery and say like, you know, you have these talents, right? What do you, what do you think you're supposed to do with them? So for now, they're just, uh, they're doing beautiful things for their family and their friends around them, which is for me, uh, extremely rewarding as a parent to see that. So happy to hear. And, and I think what you just mentioned about parenting it is true there's no instructions there is many many surprises but it's certainly the most rewarding experience of life at least i believe that and uh, as you mentioned i think as parents if we can be catalysts to spark that reflection on how can you use the gifts that each child is exhibiting since they're very very young to actually nurture that and allow them to have the courage, going back to the other point that you mentioned earlier, to actually dive deeper and, and realize incredible things. I, I think that is one of our biggest responsibilities as parents. So as you were helping employees within the corporate world before find their purpose, I, I think if parents can also play a role in a similar fashion at home, since the kids, you know, start exhibiting specific traits and strengths, I think that's a wonderful gift. Yeah. Thank you. And now let's talk about joy. Given all the beautiful things that you've just shared in terms of your personal life, your professional life, what is the biggest source of joy in your life? I think it's when you see that moment of realization in another person where they are able to do something they didn't think they could, or they take that courageous step, even a small step towards 
pursuing their dreams. I'll give you an example. I have a longtime mentee, friend, uh, and also mentor. I mean, it's a really amazing mutual relationship who worked with me, worked for me, worked alongside me. I helped him to try and, you know, pursue his dreams uh, in, in the last five, six years. It's, it's incredible. I mean, he always had this ambition to use his musical, creative, amazing voice. Like he just has this incredible voice to share that voice with the world. I sense is his, his raison d'etre. That's why he's here. But it, it's like, well, it's scary and I can't use it in my corporate job. And so what am I supposed to do with it? And so I said, well, maybe you're supposed to just share it with the world outside of work, or maybe, you know, what could you do inside of work? And anyway, he started doing a, uh, a podcast that uh, started off as just podcasting to himself. He shared it with me and maybe one other person very nervously. And a few people heard it. And then a few people latched on to it more. And then he started publishing it on YouTube. And it's actually turned into having a little following. And, you know, he's like, I don't care if it turns into something big or not, but I, I'm so happy I'm able to share my ideas, my vision with the world, and just the way he does it with his creative sketching while he talks, and then cutting and editing it all himself, and then putting it out there in the world, and, and starting a conversation and seeing what people think. And the topics are, are meaningful. It's about you know, solving climate change, uh, helping people in poverty gain access to more opportunities. And so just those thoughts, putting those thoughts out there in the world is beautiful. So really the, the most joyful thing that I can experience, I think, is, is to have joy with others, to see other people succeed, to see other people create impact, to see other people happy. And those, those would be my answers. And what could we do collectively, actually, to bring more joy to the world and reduce a lot of the suffering that we see in this world. Well, I think we have to rethink everything because unfortunately we have not got it right in the Western world, in my opinion. Uh, I, I think the American Declaration of Independence is a beautiful document that founded an incredible movement throughout the world, the, the Western world that has given people access to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as they say. However, I think the pursuit of happiness is wrong. I, I don't think you can pursue happiness, actually. I think happiness is the byproduct of shared and collective experience, connection. So when we're connected with another human being or other human beings in a positive experience, this is joy. In Hebrew, we have two words for happiness. One is asher, ashrei, and the other is simcha. And simcha is shared joy. Asher, ashrei is like a, a fleeting joy. It's a fleeting happiness. It's like I had a good ice cream and it made me happy for a second, right? I uh, accomplished something at work even. You know, I did the task. I got that little hit of dopamine. I was happy for a second. But simcha is a shared joy. It's an experience with others. And I really think that we've completely and utterly screwed this up in the Western world. We have completely forgotten about connection, communion, community with other people. Our communities are on Facebook and social media, which are, which are all sort of self-aggrandizing and egotistic and narcissistic. Let me show everyone the wonderful stuff I'm doing. I don't really care what anyone else is doing. I don't really want to talk to anyone else. I'm just going to put it all out there. And I think, I think sadly, we've forgotten that the real meaning of life, the thing that brings us joy is just being connected and together. And we're on our devices all the time and we're posting this and we're looking at this. So this is just complete disconnection from those things that actually bring us joy. And I think that's why people are sadly depressed and in, in some cases even worse suicidal. There's an absence of connection, connection to purpose, connection to some sort of higher uh, good or something that you could do and connection to other people, which are the things that bring us joy. So Collectively, as a society, what we ought to do is rethink the way that we spend our time, the things that are normal. We don't need to give our kids phones when they're eight years old. You know, we should delay gratification. We should delay narcissism or, you know, exploiting ego. And we should teach people from a very young age that joy is found just by being outside with your friends or just by you know, sitting at the dinner table with your family without distractions. And I think that hopefully that proliferates through the, the world. We can rethink our, our organizational institutions as well. And that's something that I tried to do for the better part of a decade and had some success doing. And I think the way to do that is to find early adopters, people that believe what you believe, 
If you believe that the organization could be rethought, could be reorganized, well, go and share that with other people and find people that believe what you believe and then work together in, in sort of small groups to, to make it happen, to build the company that you want to work for with your colleagues, with those people that, uh, you know, that have the same dream and vision as you do. Really love everything you've shared. And as you're talking about uh, your Jewish roots, can you tell us what has influenced the most the way you look at life and finding joy in life? Well, you mentioned my Jewish roots. And so maybe to share, I didn't talk enough about my, my lovely wife. And uh, my Jewish roots actually are from birth. But it was only through her process of conversion to Judaism that I realized the beautiful and ancient gifts that are uh, within this, this ancient tradition that I happen to have the uh, honor to be part of. And so I see myself as a link in a chain. And uh, it was marrying Diana that helped me to realize this. That chain goes back 3,500 years. And, you know, the future and perfecting our world is not a realistic pursuit, as we were talking about before uh, in the podcast. You know, get this podcast perfect. Well, that's not realistic, you know. Realistically, you can make it as good as it can be. And, and that's good enough. And so... In, in our lifetimes, we aim maybe to make the world perfect, but it's not for us to complete the perfection of the world. It's also neither are we free to desist from trying to pursue its improvement. And so I think that that's something that's really helped me to find joy because it can be tremendously overwhelming trying to perfect the world. It can actually hurt your ability to be in joy because you're always thinking about this tension about what's wrong and what needs to change and what needs to be better. But actually, Judaism teaches that we should work to make the world better six days of the week. And the seventh day, we should rest. We should enjoy the world that is. And so really uh, this beautiful gift that I, of, of keeping Shabbat, which is this day a week where you sort of rest. And it's not rest from physical exertion. It's rest from creative work of improving and perfecting and, and working to, to, to labor away at making this world just a little bit better. And I think without the just sitting down and enjoying what's already here, which is pretty damn good, to be honest, it's hard, hard, also hard to find joy. So I find finding that balance between creating the world that ought to be and enjoying the world that is. And that's so beautiful. And, and this makes me think about the future. If you look at Hayden, in many years from now, what would be some key milestones or aspirations that you'd have for yourself that would really allow you to say, wow, I've lived a very joyful life? I've thought about this question a lot, Andrea, and uh, I had a, a beautiful coach, shout out to Kiara, who uh, helped me learn what's called the uh, 12-week year. And it's a process uh, by which you set yourself a life vision three-year goals, one-year goals, 12-week goals, and then tactics every day or every week that you can do to pursue those 12-week goals. And so this purpose statement, right, of unleashing human energy to make the world better, to create a more righteous world. Um, wh when I think about sort of the end of my life, I think about the goals and how we could measure, you know, that as a tangible outcome. And I, I would love to be able to help every single person in this world gain access to renewable energy. And I, I would love to be able to do that by helping people that want to build startups, that want to have a vision or an idea for how to store energy or move energy or harness the sun's energy to power remote villages, for example. I have a, a real interest in, in uh, unleashing those people's potential so that they can create a better world, a, a world where everyone has access to renewable, clean energy, not damaging the world for future generations. Maybe that's overly ambitious. Maybe that won't happen, but I, I don't think that I'm free to desist from its pursuit either. And I think the other things that I'm aiming to do in my life are to you know, I, I want my family to stand at my funeral and say, this was a righteous human being who lived his life well, who, who taught us the value of connectivity with others and doing, you know, the right thing, not just the expedient thing. I'd like my kids, this is emotional, but I'd like my kids to, uh, to say that I was a good dad, that I was there for them, that I cared for them, that I gave them the tools that they needed and helped them find their own tools in their own way, their own purpose to be successful in this world and continuing the chain and pursuing the perfection of our world. Hayden, thank you so much for those beautiful words and inspiring stories and sharing your aspirations for the future. It's been an immense pleasure to have you here. I wish you continued success to unleash 
human energy and other types of energy that can create a better world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's a great pleasure to be part of this, and I wish you much success with your journey as well. Mm-hmm.